This is a totally different deal. The reason this is impressive is not because of the property, it's because of the acquisition strategy. In real estate, there's acquisition strategies, there's financing funding strategies, and there's exit strategies. All right? This is an acquisition strategy that actually involves the funding of the project as well. So in this particular house, I know that's going to be hard to read, so I'm going to let me see if I can pull that up and go through this. So this is how I analyze a rental property. All right, I pick a little bit different than this, but pretty much I figure out the cap rate of my rental properties. And talk about the training and education, why this is important. As I look back, I, I bought about 10 rental properties, maybe more. I did 10 or so deals before I joined this training group. Looking back at the rental properties that I have, I would say almost half of them I wouldn't have bought. That I bought just based on not really knowing, not knowing how to evaluate it. You know, I bought this house for 40000 because the one next to it went for 50000 That's not a reason to buy a rental property, all right? You know, we really believe and teach about cash flow. There's long-term strategies as far as equity buildup, but you can't spend equity unless you sell the house or you refinance it. So... Cash flow is king. It's the way that I evaluate rental properties. This one, the, the house, uh, we could get it for one thirty-one. They had a mortgage that had a balance of one hundred thirty-one thousand, and the rehab cost is a little bit more than what I thought it was going to be. I said I think that my meet up fifty-five hundred. It's actually going to be about five six thousand. We're going to put into this. Basically, we just repainted it, and a lot of it was little stuff like the garage needed to be brought up to code as far as the electrical goes. We had a little furnace problem we had to fix. And then the closing cost, and your closing cost will probably be higher than that, but I do some things that, uh, that saves me a lot on the closing costs. So this would be the total investment. The monthly insurance is about 50, or, uh, 70, uh, 76. The property tax is about 3,500, about 3,600, almost 3,700. So the monthly expenses are here, the rent, I already have a renter, I just advertised it. Someone wanted to run it right away. We're not sure if she's the right applicant or if we're gonna put it on the market. I'll talk about that in a minute. So there's the monthly revenue. There's the annual revenue. So if you take this number and divide it by how much money we'll have in, the 131 plus the 6,000 plus closing costs, it'll give us about a 6.7% ROI. Is anybody excited about that? I know I'm not. <clears throat> All right, I would never do the deal. A traditional purchase of this property, never in a million years would I want to do that. Okay? <coughs> but because we're educated and trained, we can look beyond what normal people, normal people, <coughs> what the average person would do and look at, oh, if I bought it for this, what's my ROI? And that's uh, creative acquisitions like subject to. So subject to is short for subject to existing financing. So I bought this property subject to existing financing. So we had to, you have to find a motivated seller in order to do this. So somebody from the group, and that's a great thing. We talked about the value of joining our group in terms of the education part, but equally, if not more important and beneficial to that, is the networking. So I didn't find this property, it found me through somebody in our group. So somebody in our group that's being trained knew about a subject to, knew enough to ask the right questions, but didn't know enough to pull the trigger, all right? They didn't know how to execute the subject to, or not comfortable with executing the subject to, because they've never done one before. So by me being connected to the group, and actually dedicating my Thursdays to help facilitate study groups, then they knew me, and came to me, and brought me this deal. I don't even know in the last day, I would say of the eight flips that I'm doing right now, probably at least half or more came from people within the group. So if you're looking for properties, one of the way to do it is to be connected with a group and then work really hard to be the smartest guy in the room or, or to take your classes more than anybody else in the room so people are going to you for the deal or you for the money because you know how to raise capital. So this is not exciting. Okay, it was a trick question. I'm glad nobody said, oh yeah, that's great. What I look for, I look for a 14 cap or above for my rental property. It's pretty aggressive, but that's what I look for because I do it, I buy based on cash flow. All right, now here, let's take a look at the same, this is the same house, this is the same price, but now let's look at it as a subject to acquisition and let's see what our return on investment would be. All right, so we've got the same purchase price. Let's see if I can get both of them up there at the time. Whoops. Uh, skip this. Have moved me down the screen. All right, 
So on this one, we got the same purchase price, we've got the same acquisition cost. Now, why did I reduce the closing costs here? Anybody idea how, how I'm probably saving at least $1,000, probably more, on the closing costs? If you're sharing the cost with the person that's selling it? No, because I've done these and I know that I'm not going to close, I'm not saying to do this, this is my disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, all right? But I closed at their house. I knew how to how all the paperwork, everything was done. All I all my closing costs is is a recording fee and transfer stamps. Oh, wow. And sometimes you have to do a point of sale inspection. Not here, but in some areas you do. So it's probably even lower than that. So you can see my total investment goes down. I also want to be conservative. It goes down by a thousand dollars. But here's where it starts to get very interesting. All right. Their mortgage, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance all together is $1,143, okay? So I don't have, or, or rolled into that already is my property tax, it's already my uh, insurance is already in there, and my property tax, right? Okay, so now, if get, even if I get the same rent, the cash flow, you say, well, the cash flow went down, that's true, but what happened to my ROI? My ROI goes up to 39 per, 38%. Why? When you get your ROI, remember what you do is you take your annual revenue divided by how much money you have into it. How much money do I have into this property? Let's go back here. Five, 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 five. So I have 6,000 and 500. 6,500 as opposed to 137,000, right? Or actually, it's even all the way down to there, 138,500. So when you make, what's my annual again? About 2,500 on 6,500? Is that a good deal? Mm -hmm. That's a great deal, right? And you can do that. The other thing great about subject two is I'm not on the mortgage. So therefore, how many of these can I do? Unlimited. Unlimited. I'm, am I restricted by the bank? No, because it's not my mortgage. Even with great credit, when I had really good credit, I was buying a lot of rental properties and do. Everybody heard of the Burr method? You know, it's you know buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and then you do it again. Okay. So even when I was doing that, my banker who loved me kept saying, Randy, you know, we can't do this forever. You know, you're up to ten properties, you're up to twenty properties, whatever. There's going to be an end to this. Okay, this, there could be no end to it. You could have hundreds of properties. The person that teaches creative acquisitions, Chris <coughs> Albin, I think he did 300, had 300 of these at one time. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine that? You know, and also the other thing is, I had somebody that wanted to partner with me and he had money. He didn't have the time, didn't have the knowledge, but he had the money. So to be honest with you, it's not, I'm not getting a 40% ROI. I actually have an infinite ROI because I don't have any money into it at all. Okay, so I offered my partner. My partner is going to get half of this, so my partner is going to get a is that a 70, 19 percent return. You think people would be happy for a 19 percent return on their money? Absolutely, right. So he's going to get a 19 percent return. I'm going to get a 19 percent return, and he's paying for everything. Okay. Would you so call me on the next one? Yeah. <laughs> Would you call me on the next one, yeah. please? <laughs> but see, by knowing, here's how important knowledge. People get hung up on the money, right? They think that it's real estate's all about money. I don't have money to do it. I got to, you know, they don't understand the knowledge, the value of the knowledge and experience and networking. This was all done from my knowledge, my experience, and my networking. All right. Now it cost me the money, some money to get my knowledge to get my education but the amount of money that you can make from then on out by knowing what to do and being connected to people that are like-minded like our group is is invaluable I mean, you cannot put a price tag on that um, and I want to talk a little bit about that training program at the end any questions about this yes go ahead. what subject to remember it's subject to existing finance okay Subject to existing finance means I'm buying it, right. but subject to the mortgage that's already there. Right. Okay. Now, this is not an assumable mortgage. Years ago, there were some assumable mortgages. VA loans, maybe they still are, are assumable mortgage if you qualify for the mortgage. 
This is not a consumable mortgage. In fact, this is a Chase mortgage. This is the second one I've done in a short period of time that happens to be a Chase mortgage. It's not assumable. I'm not officially assuming the mortgage. What I'm doing is I'm getting the owner to agree, because it's in their best interest at this point, to allow me, or first of all, to give me their property, to sign the deed over to me. In exchange, I sign a document that I'm legally responsible to make their mortgage payments until either I refinance, I pay it off, I sell it and pay it off, or if that doesn't happen and that their mortgage gets called due, I give it back. And I want to go into kind of the a little bit of the paperwork. This is going to give you a, 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 a kind of a snippet of the strategy. I don't want you to think, oh, I, I went to a class last night and uh, I can do subject two. No, you get legal counsel. There's a lot of stuff, but I want to give you a taste of it. How if you learn, really learn this, you can you can do this. Oh, oh by the way, um, yeah. In this in this scenario, what is the benefit for the? Or the person who owned the property okay, let's, let's start there. Okay, so why would someone be motivated? Think of the situation, and this is the people that we target with this. And we do mailings. This is not one of our mailings, but we do mailings. This, this happened to fall out of my, my uh, notebook there. And this is a mailing that I get all the time because I'm a cash buyer, so I get these, you know, ask me about for properties. So this is uh, a mailing that I'll get, and this is what we put out there for our, uh, to try to find properties. So who is your tar who is who can you imagine would be willing and why would they be willing to deed over their property for you to pay their mortgage payment? Class participation. That was not before. <laughs> okay, can't afford the mortgage. And and more importantly, can't sell for whatever reason. Can't sell their house, right? Wouldn't that be an option? Well, just sell the house. What happens if the house is worth one hundred and forty thousand, and they have a hundred and thirty-one thousand dollar mortgage. How much is it going to cost them to sell it? Well, traditionally, if they use a broker, it's five percent. Five percent on a hundred and what I say, one hundred forty thousand is what they sell it for. Seven thousand, just like that. Okay, so right away they're out to basically zero closing costs. Not my closing costs, their closing costs are probably going to be about three grand or more, right? So now they're already underwater, okay? And that doesn't cost, that's include, maybe they have to do inspections, and there's part, they have to pay part of the transfer stamps. Uh, there's a lot of costs that could be, and that's if they can even sell it for the market value, right? So, and then they have to fix up their house, make it look nice. So it will cost them money to sell their house. I'm offering them to sell their house for free. Okay, so that that's kind of your ideal person. Okay, the other person, it, person, and I've done this before, when they're moving out of state. And listen, when we have these conversations and we teach these conversations, we're not having these conversations like, okay, how can I get this person's house? No, we meet with them. How can I help this person? How can I find out what their situation is, and then give them recommendations? We do a training on the eight things that are facing that options for people facing foreclosure. And so it's kind of like that. Okay, here's one option. Here's another option. Here's another option. And we just eliminate it. And then down at the bottom might be subject to. It might not be the best option ever, but it might be their only option. Okay? That they can do it. I've had people move away, and they don't want to be out-of-state landlords, and they don't want to pay money to sell their house. It's like, I just want to get rid of that house. I just want to. One of the first subject to deals I did, we trained people how to make phone calls to build a buyer's list if you want to wholesale. And I called the guy up, and this is what he said. <clears throat> First of all, what I was doing is trying to see, because people that are listing a rental property are usually, usually either people that they got stuck with this property, that it was their parents or somebody, and they have to rent it out, or it's going to be someone that um, is a real estate investor, and they have a lot of rental properties, and they're advertising one of them for rent. So I called this guy up. I said, hey, I noticed that you've got this, this uh, home advertised in Craigslist. I was just wondering if you were a real estate investor and if you would be interested if I could bring you properties 70 to 80 cents on the dollar, would you be interested? Here's what's his response. Heck no! I don't want it. even that accent. Heck no! I don't even want this one. I'm like, oh, and I laugh. I said, well, what's wrong with your house? So we had a conversation and what happened was he rented it out for a while, moved out of state, rented it out. The renter stopped paying rent. He did not want to be a landlord anymore and he just wanted to get rid of it. That turned into my first subject to acquisition. Okay. So anyway, that's why there's many reasons, but that's, that's 
kind of your typical person. And we have a software program where you can target a mailing to people that have little or no equity. That's your target. What if you have to sell and you have little or no equity? What if you're behind on a couple payments, maybe? So we can target those, that audience, okay? Hey, Randy, can, can I yeah. add something really yes. quick that may, just for the benefit of the audience, one of the things that's really cool about this is that you've you've raised capital with this strategy, with, with Subject 2, and then sometimes people don't think about it that way. He just raised capital through whatever that note holder is, if it's Chase or Wells Fargo or whatever, he just raised $131,000 of capital without having to do anything other than assume what's already out there. Yeah, that's and that's, that's kind of a, a that's point, that, point that sort of is mind-numbing for me when I look at it like that. It, it's just that easy to just get $130,000 from a bank that he didn't even know, you know? Great, great point, Dean. Thank you. Um, listen, so in my uh, in my meetup group, when I sent you out there, I said about 200%. Actually, I started working the numbers. I'd be more conservative. So it's not 200%. It's actually infinite for me. So I guess in a way I was being modest because actually the return is actually going to be infinite because I don't even have any money into it. But here's what, and this, one of our uh, instructors' name is Mark Kohler. He's a CPA and an attorney. And he talks about when you buy a rental property, if you buy it right, you should have about 100% return on your money. Okay? So here's how people say, that's impossible. How can you do that? Well, it's because people are only looking at one thing. Most of the time, they're only thinking cash flow. But let's look at this particular deal, and what is our actual return on the money going to be? Something called depreciation. You may not know it, but in a rental property, even though it could appreciate its value, you can actually write it off on your taxes like it's going down in value. All right? You guys have heard of straight line depreciation? All right? You know what that is? All right? So these are the things that you should learn because this gives you uh, a, a knowledge to talk to people that are real estate or have money and they don't know real estate. If you know real estate, you can show them how this is going to help them on their taxes. So I'll just, I won't do this because it's you know, too much to do with training. But well, we'll just use straight line depreciation. We have a class that's called uh, cost segregation that will even show you how to accelerate this further and to make this number even larger. But you can depreciate your house, the, the, the building, like this rental property, I can't depreciate land, but I can depreciate this in the garage over 27 and a half years. Okay? 27 and a half years. So I just take the, the cost of the building and garage, I just you know, threw out a number about about 120 estimated it. So it's about, it's over $4,000 a year that I can write off as depreciation. So even though it didn't lose value, you can write that off in your taxes. So let's say you're even just modestly at a 25% tax bracket, your state and federal combined is, let's say you were, you know, 20% on one and five on the other, it adds up to 25%. 25%, so you're writing this off, that's not $4,000 in your pocket, but it is 25% of that in your pocket, you're going to get over $1,000 more in your tax return next year. This property, just on depreciation alone, is going to put $1,000 more in your pocket. Okay. If you take that $1,000 and divide it by the $6,500, it's all the money that was put into the deal, $6,500, and you're getting another $1,000 back, that adds up to another 17%. That's depreciation. Another way is appreciation. So if you look at the history of the United States <coughs> housing market, any given segment of 25 years, it's pretty well established that it's a 5%. Houses appreciated over uh, on the average 5% over any 25-year segment. I'm going more conservative. I only use a 3% appreciation rate. So 3%, this is valued at about 150000 The house, three houses down, actually sold for one forty one seventy five. So I actually might quick flip this for a twenty thirty thousand dollars profit. It's possible, um, but let's just use one hundred fifty. Goes up three percent. The appreciation goes up forty five. So I should make forty five hundred dollars a year just by hanging on to this house if it just has the natural appreciation that we've averaged over the last twenty five years. Again, if you divide that by oh I'm sorry tax rate at twenty five percent, I don't get all of that depreciation. If I just look at the, oh, actually, you know what? I don't have to subtract. Well, I should do it the other way. This actually should be 75% of that number. I, I cheated myself. This should be three times as much. This actually three times seven is, what, 40? Is that 41? This should be 41%. No, three times that number. Oh, three times 17. 51, right? 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51. 51
said this uh, this afternoon. So, because we don't have to take out the tax rate. It's not this is not figured out that way. So that actually should be fifty one percent. Now here's another thing: mortgage pay down. So even if the house doesn't appreciate at all, I'm paying my rent. How am I paying that mortgage payment? It's not me. Who's making my mortgage payment? For me? My renter, the tenant, right? So just by make my tenant paying rent and putting that towards the mortgage, the mortgage is going down right now about three hundred dollars a month, and it's going to keep increasing every single month. So if you know how amortization works, every single month it's going to go three hundred, you know, three five, three ten, three fifteen. It's going to keep going larger and larger. But let's just use three twenty because it's about three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars right now over a twelve month period. That's actually the rent or the mortgage balance is going to be paid down almost four thousand dollars. That's more money that's really in my pocket. I'm building equity even if it doesn't appreciate because my loan is going down. My my renter's paying my loan down more and more and more. So again, if you even take out, see that one, uh, pay down. I really don't. I don't have to do. I don't have to divide that by twenty five percent. Because that's actually money that I'm gonna. If I sold the house, that would be all equity. Mm -hmm. So we got to do quick math. Four times three times that is 45, right? So we got 45 there. We got 50. We're already over 100 percent. And then this was from the cash flow was from the previous screen. So we're at about 100, and uh, we got 35 in there. Seven. That's 20. We're about we're over 150 percent. Okay. So people say, why real estate? Why real estate? Because I can be in the stock market, stock market, and I can get because they're only looking at one thing, like appreciation. Like appreciation, they'll look at one thing and they'll say, well, the real estate only goes up five percent a year. I can get that in the stock market. Yeah, but it's not just five percent. You're not leveraging. Look at how you can leverage that. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to make a comment about a subject to deal with an existing mortgage in place that's been being paid on. Mm -hmm. I mean, finding mm -hmm. a mortgage that's been being paid on for five years or 10 years or 15 years is a gold mine that's a good point. Yes. because every payment that's made, a lot larger, significant yes. portion of the principal is being paid and the interest is a lot less. So the, these these can be gold mines of deals if you find a house that somebody's been yeah. paying on for 15 years. No, that's a, that's a great point. Is this? Can you share with this one? I mean, how long have they been paying this one? Um, I don't. I can't remember right offhand. Um, but let's say it's on a thirty years. years. Okay, great. I mean, you're you're already starting yeah, to get yeah, toward yeah. you know more principal yeah, versus interest. So. Yeah, about seven years. And the mortgage is like three point seven five percent. That's fantastic. Wow. Fix for thirty. Really yeah. good. Yeah, for thirty. Fix for thirty. Fix for 30. Fix for 30. Fantastic. Yeah, that is. Okay, so just a couple little it. things. What's that? If they refinance. If they didn't refinance recently, but it sounds like, yeah. No, they did. They Their last financing was, was seven, seven years, years ago. Seven years yeah. Ago, yeah, that's so good. That's the mortgage that I assume. Okay. Oh, just a, so when you're putting these deals together, I'm just going to give you little snippets, things that you address on the purchase offer. So the purchase price. So what's the person price? Because, you know, as the mortgage gets paid down, so let's say it delays another month or another month before we close, then that purchase price actually goes down. I usually put the lower of, and I put a number, let's say it's at 130, uh, 131,500. So I say something like the lower of 131,500, right in here, or the loan balance on the date of closing for loan number, and I put the loan number on there. So what that does is it locks in that price for me, so even if it gets delayed a month, well now I'm only buying it for the loan balance, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can put in a price, which is approximate loan balance, but then when you have that verbiage in there, it's going to decrease, the purchase price is going to decrease every month that it goes. Because sometimes, you know, closings can get delayed a month or so, and now I'm paying less for it. So in that scenario, you're capturing what they would have otherwise been giving up as equity. You're, you're taking yeah, equity. Yeah, so from that, good. yeah, and once we get it under contract, any equity that evolves, that, that is created from then on, it goes to me. All right, now... Nobody has asked this question, or thought, at least you probably thought of it though. So why doesn't everybody do this? People are scared of this, why? Right? Because of something called the due on sale clause. Anybody heard of the due? I know you people have been trained, and we're not as you know this. Anybody new here tonight ever heard of the due on sale clause or know what that is? Okay, so these aren't assumable mortgages. These mortgages have a, quote, due on sales clause. And I'm going to tell you about what that might say. It's going to be something like this. It's going to say... If more than 25% of the ownership of the property uh, that's being collateralized, which means the mortgage for being collateralized, um, changes, the lender, at the lender's discretion, here's the key word, may call the mortgage due and payable. 
or accelerated, they'll say. So the key word there is may, all right? And people think it is, oh, if you sell it, my mortgage is going to be due. It's not what your mortgage says. Your mortgage says that the lender will have the option they can call it due. Why would a lender want to call the mortgage due that's being paid and is on time? Only if it's on year 29 of a 30-year amortization. Schedule. Yeah, I mean, if they thought they had a big chunk of equity there, they might say, hey, you know, there's $100,000 of equity. I would never let it get that big, right? I'd refinance it. I'd sell it. I'd do whatever. But a mortgage company is in the business of lending. So even if they got this property, but they'd have to relend it. They'd have to own this property. They'd have to foreclose. They'd have to, all this expense, it's not to their advantage, especially if there's little or no equity there. All right. So, but to cover myself, I want to make sure I explain that to the homeowner. And I put in this, and you can, you know, again, you should always consult an attorney. This is something I put together that I have them sign and notarize. Basically, the homeowner says, I'm aware there's a due on sale clause. And then what the states is that if the lender calls the mortgage due, that I have 60 days, the, the buyer, me, I have 60 days to either pay off the loan balance, to sell the property and pay off the balance, to refinance and pay off the balance, or worst case scenario, I can deed the property back and the homeowner will uh, not hold me liable in any way for damages or anything like that, right? So that makes them comfortable, right? They're like, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if they call it due? Well, then I got 60 days and I got to perform. How long would it take someone to be foreclosed on? Six months to a year, and I've got 60 days. In the worst case scenario, they're going to get their property back, right? But think about it. They're going to get their property back. Now it's all painted. Now it's all fixed. <laughs> Now they might have a cash flowing tenant in it, no. all right? <laughs> now they are going to owe less because we made payments. I don't, I, I, I'm more at risk of them doing it than them, you know, because I don't want to lose mine. I'll probably just go in and refinance it, okay? But anyway, that kind of verbiage, thinking ahead like that is very important. That's why you need to get a lot of training on this. Then we send a, a note to the letter, a letter to the lender, telling them that uh, my company, uh, For His Glory LLC 7, will be making the mortgage <coughs> payments on Pamela's behalf. Uh, this loan number, and then I send a check with it, say, please find attached the check for the next mortgage payment. Guess what? If that check is cashed, could they ever say, oh, I never saw that letter? Mm -hmm. They can't because they were both yeah. the same together, right?